chapter. <clears throat> Hebrews 11 chapter is called the Hebrew Hall of Faith, right? We know they have the Hebrew, they have all kinds of halls of fame, but Hebrews 11 chapter speaks of the Hebrew Hall of Faith. And Jesus said one time, he said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to a mountain, be thou removed and cast into yonder sea, and it shall be done. And you remember that lesson when I put that lesson and I took my pen and I put it, I put it on the pulpit like this. And I said, anybody here that has faith not to move a mountain, just move my pen. Remember? Yes. Now, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can move a mountain. I don't want you to move a mountain tonight. I want you to move my pen. Who's going to give it a shot? And I remember that day, a brother sat at the back, and he was going to really make himself. You know why I did not allow him to come up? Because he would have made himself so silly, because I knew what he wanted to do. He wanted to come and say, this is fate, I'm going to move it. Fate without works is dead. That's what he was going to say. And when he was going to reach almost here, I was going to stop him. I says, hold on a minute. Let's read the scripture. If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you will say unto the mountain, Be thou removed and cast into yonder sea, and it shall be done. Now you stand there and say to the pen, Move. And if you can't, then go read your Bible before you make another trip up to the front. But you see, that's you sometimes have to help people because people don't always read. And in that message, I said, the one time I've seen, uh, someone said one time, he has never seen anyone move a mountain by faith, but he has seen people move mountains with bulldozers and machinery, and they move it. But you know, I've seen people climb mountains, and they're mountain climbers. And it tells you that faith is so small in our lives, because as human beings, we don't even have faith as a grain of mustard seed. That's what Jesus really meant. He was not kidding around. So when you think you have a lot of faith, you don't even have faith as a grain of mustard seed. And it's the grace of God that has given us faith. Now when Jesus told a person, your faith has made you well, it is so smaller than a mustard seed. But the grace of God has given us faith. To have confidence in him. I'm, <clears throat> I'm sitting here tonight. <clears throat> because I have faith. I have faith that the chair is not going to break with me. While I'm sitting on it. I have faith that the building is not going to collapse. Without a little bit of faith. We would not even survive. And so in Hebrews 11 chapter. It tells us about a different category of faith. And that is so important for us to understand. Because when I say faith, people think, oh gosh, faith to heal the sick and raise the dead and do all kinds of stuff. Well, I tell you what. I have faith in God. I have never seen God. And yet I've seen him. I've never seen the devil. And yet I've seen him. I've... How can a person look at this beautiful universe and the world and the stars and creation? You know, I love nature. I love nature. When I see, I have a little squirrel in my backyard now. That's my favorite squirrel. He has no tail. I don't know what he did with his tail, but he has no tail. He almost looks like a black rabbit. Yeah. Right? But he's a squirrel. And... Every time I, I wanted today, today I wanted to give him a name because he's like my favorite squirrel and he's very, fe, uh, you know, he's fight, fighting, like he's very um, aggressive, aggressive in fighting everybody else to get on top. He likes to climb up uh, the bird feeder 
and chase away the birds, right? And I love animals. I just love animals. I love nature. I love uh, things that you can see around. I love, you know, when you, you, if you can understand, one day I stood on my driveway and Nadine came along and there was an ant, one single ant, carrying a piece of breadcrumbs four times or five times bigger than he was. <laughs> And he's got it up in the air, and we said, let's see where he's going. And he starts on one side of the driveway, and he's going forever. Where is he carrying this piece of breadcrumbs? And you give up, because how far would you go? I have, Chandri has a hummingbird feeder in front, and she feeds the hummingbird. But the ants get to it. And these big ants will get up on the pole and get into the hummingbird feeder, right? And pollute it. And so I came up with an invention. I took a paint spray can cover and put a hole inside. And I put it in such a way that the bar that goes up to the hummingbird feeder, that spray can cup was around that bar with water inside. And there... Was it you with me when we look at this one? This big ant, a big ant, you know, a nice big one. He came up, he's crawled up right up, and he's on the cover. He's walking around the cover, and I'm looking at him. I video him. I took my camera, I was taking him. And he's looking, and he's looking at the hummingbird feeder with all the nectar inside. And he wants to jump. He wants to get from here to here. Because he can't go down to get on the pole. Because there's water there. And I'm looking at him. And Dini and I are looking at him. And you know what? He averaged himself. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and he jumped. But he missed. <laughs> because ants are not made to jump. Spiders do amazing things. They, they travel for, you know, across the whole... I don't know how a spider reaches, you know, 10 feet across and has a web. But you see, nature is such a beautiful thing, and you look at nature, and you look at the, the birds, and you look at all of these things in creation, and then you say, there's no designer for it? Yes, yeah. there's, it's, it just happened. It was a big accident in space, and it just happened. Darwin, it just was an accident. Big bang, and we all came, and all these marvelous things happened. Well... I've had a few accidents in my life. None resulted in that kind of stuff. But there's a God. And when you understand there is a God, you might never see him literally, but you see his handiwork. And the amazing parts of creation every day. I walked in Illinois one time, and we were walking from one place to the other, and then right down in the middle of this dirty parking lot, one flower stood up. And I stood and I looked at that and I said in this rugged, barren place, all its gunk and cigarette butts, there was one little flower. And guess what? I cleared the butts and I took a picture of that. Because it tells me that in the midst of chaos, something beautiful can come up. And that's how you see life. Because... There is a beauty in serving God. I wish I was young all the time. I come in and I say young. I'm not talking 17. And when I was 17, I was very stupid. I'm talking about being 35, 36 years and you remain like that. Wouldn't that be something if creation was such that when you reach 50, the next year you go 49 and then you go back to 47? You reach a halfway point and then you back it down. Wouldn't that be nice? Of course, I don't know what you'll do when you turn six. But um, you think of these things and you think that there is God. And I believe that there is a God and faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. I believe in God even though I have not seen him. Here in Hebrews 11 chapter, uh, Paul is, I think he is the writer, 
And he makes a statement here in that first part of that chapter. He says, now faith is the substance or the assurance of things hoped for. I don't have it yet, but I have faith. And that is why when we were in school, we had goals. And I told Jeremiah, I said, you should have a goal. You should want to become something important. Not some video game guy. You want to become somebody that would be adding to society. Amen. Plan to be somebody big. Want to be a doctor. Want to be something out in society. And then work towards that. It's like doing a piece of art. Because I loved art. And when you start art and you're doing a piece of art, uh, people want to see the art before it's done would not understand what you're doing because you're the artist. They say, why well, you're slopping everything up? Well, I'm doing the background. It's like doing ceramics. When you, before you can do your antiquing of that piece of uh, uh, ceramic piece, you have to stain it. You have to fettle it. You have to, first of all, Fettle it, bake it, bring it out, and then you stain it with a strong stain. And then when it's dry, stained and dry, if you want a color, if you want to paint someone, like um, Brother John, for example, if you want to paint Brother John, that, that figurine looks like him, but it's all white. Okay, it's, it, you want to paint him. What you do, the easiest way, you can take a paintbrush and go and try to do all, but there's an easy way. You find his main color. His main color is there, and you want to keep that as a final translucent stain. So it's called translucent. So you take his main color and keep that aside, and then you look at the darker colors, right? You want the creases, the darker color in the creases. And so you paint the whole face in that dark color. Right? So that remains there. No, you paint the face first in the light color. And then you paint it over with a translucent dark color. Then you take a cloth and you rub everything off. And when you rub it off, the dark color remains and the light color comes out. Otherwise, you will be taking a paintbrush and doing all those fine things. I learned to do that, and it's part of art. It's a part of developing thing. But I know what the finished product would be. And so I'm working to the finished product. See, that's how God works. Uh, and, and when you, whatever it is, the, the most beautiful thing you can find is an apple tree in the spring. Apple, pink, apple, pink, and cherry blossom. What is it? Cherry. cherry pink and apple blossom white. So you look at cherry, the, ch the cherry tree is pink and the apple blossom is white and it's beautiful. But the blossoms don't last because they're there for a reason. They're there and nature is such that you need bees to pollinate. And so the bees would come, they're feeding on that and in the process of feeding that, God created those bees with hairy legs. And when they go to get their nectar, they don't even know that they're transporting pollen from one flower to the other, pollinating a plant, making it, the fruit come forth. And before you know it, the flowers, the petals are gone and a little bud comes up. But guess what? Don't eat it. It's apple, but not ready to be eaten. There's a process. There's a process. Wait. I looked at a little sign I had today that says, under construction, God's not finished with me yet. You know, I, got, I told Chad we went into Canadian Tire and they're there forever setting up Christmas decorations and the aisles are blocked under construction. Little yellow ribbons cut across. Well, I'm under construction. Not finished yet. Don't expect me to be perfect. Don't expect me to be patient like God wants me patient. Job's not done yet. It's a project to be done. Don't condemn my stain when I put it on. It says, but that's not brother John. Wait until the job is done. And when you think all of that is done, wait until I put a lacquer on it. 
and finishing touches. See, it's, it's an amazing process, but I must have a goal. So faith is not what I see, but what I hope to see and accomplish. Faith is the substance of things that I hope for. You go to school, not because you want to go to school for the rest of your life. No, you go to school to accomplish something that you would be able to reach your goals in life. Why do you come to church to hear them sing some songs? No, I'm here to be edified and to be challenged that when it's over, I've learned something about God that will motivate my life. Amen. Told Brother Richard today, I said, maybe in many churches, the pastor might be the only one perfected when it's all over. Why is he there? Why is the Lord giving him a congregation that gives him that challenge? It's for his development. The, the, the storms in your life are designed by God to make you skilled sailors. No war, no victory. No sin, no salvation. We need the opposing elements to come against us. And so here it says, faith is the substance or the assurance of things I'm hoping to accomplish. So I have faith that he which has called me is going to finish this job in my life. Just be patient now. It says, it's the evidence, the proving of things not seen. And by it, elders obtain, everybody say that, a good report. And that reminds me, school days. Back in Guyana, school days. Report day. It's just like here. You got your report and you got to take it home. And you can't doctor it. You can't change that report. And it's not like here. In this country, they don't tell you if you're number 30 in the class. See, back home, if there's 30 people in the class, your marks put you on a number. You need a first, second, third, fourth, or you go down to 30. If you're 30, we call you the shepherd because you're driving the flock. You understand what I mean? So your, 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 your confidence is developed and it's challenged by what you hope to accomplish. Wouldn't that be sad if you work all week and the boss tells you thank you? No paycheck this week, just thank you, go home. No. You're working because you want a paycheck so you can live by it. Well, faith, you have faith in that job to a certain extent. I don't know how microscopic it is, but to a certain extent. And so we all have faith, but very, very small faith. It, if, if it was not for the grace of God, we would not even survive. And so the elders, the champions of the faith, they all had faith because they wanted a good report. What kind of report do you want? When it's over and your life is over and, you know, this week I've had so many challenges with people. I post something on Facebook about chocolate bars and I get these people sending messages. Don't eat too much, you're going to die. You know, like it's going to kill you. You know, I kid with them because I, I, I can eat chocolate every day, but I'm not going to eat 10 pounds of chocolate every day. Chocolate is good for you. You know, if you can control yourself, coffee is good for you, but don't drink like you're an addict. Don't eat like you're an addict. Vegetables are good for you, but you kill, stretch your stomach so much with vegetables, you can die. You understand what I mean? Abuse in anything can destroy you. And so this week, I've been hearing, hearing all kinds of comments, and I like to respond and say, well, I, I'm happy. The doctor tells me I'm okay, and somebody gets upset at that. Well, don't worry with the doctor. Well, you might look good, but you might not be healthy. Well, don't we all want to look good when they put us in the casket? Even if you're ugly in that casket, don't they say you look good? 
Don't they come and lie to you? And they, you get these guys to doctor your face? You see, I went to Brother Jaya's funeral and his daughter said, Oh, Daddy looks so good. I said, No, he doesn't look good. I said, He don't even look like him. Why are you telling me he looks good? He doesn't look good. He's dead. And he does not look like the man I know. Well, I haven't seen him for a long time. But if I had seen him in a casket I, and then I didn't know who I was going to, it didn't look like Brother Jayo. So I can't lie. You think he's looking good, that's fine. Death does never look good. But you see, the, the faith that the elders had was confidence in God in spite of the circumstances. And so tonight, very quickly, we want to look at some of these things. And it talks about all of these individuals here. It talked about a Abel in verse 4. It talked about Enoch in verse 5. Look at this. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, that is, taste death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before the, his translation, he had his testimony. What did Enoch do so that he could receive the good report? He had this testimony that he pleased God. That's something else. You know, it's good to please Brother Singh. It's good to please your fellow man. But to please God? That's a big, that's a big challenge. This man had a repetition that he pleased God. Right? Paul says, but without faith it is impossible to please God. See, you can't please God if you don't believe there in God. We must have faith. To believe what God says. And to follow that. And you have to face the fact and the reality of your own commitment and dedication. If you're a hypocrite and you know you're a hypocrite, tell God about it. Amen. He's one person that you can tell and he wouldn't gossip your name. Mm -hmm. Say, Lord, you know, I'm trying to serve you. But you know, I'm coming, I'm making little progress here as you help me. But Lord, I'm still a hypocrite. You can talk to him about it. He would not gossip with the angels. You're, but you have, Lord, I would like to be like you. Be ye as perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. I like to be like you, but I need your help. See, David did that. David said, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mom conceive me. He says, Lord, I've sinned. Against thee only have I done this terrible thing. He says, forgive me, so I can teach other people your ways. See, you had a goal. Without a goal, you'll be a passive individual just passing the life. Where are you going? I don't know. What's your ambition? I don't know. What grade you're in? I'm in grade 12. What you plan to become? I don't know. See, without that, you don't have that drive and that motivation. Now, I have a problem with individuals that feel like they're going to be in the first resurrection because I don't think anyone can easily qualify to be in the first phase of the first resurrection. So what do you do when we sing the song, Oh Lord, I want to be in the first resurrection, don't sing it. No, sing it. You can't give up. You're only done when you're done. So fight the good fight of faith and keep shooting for the highest point. All right? Shoot for the highest goal. Seek that you may excel. And if you fall short, then settle for that. But shoot for the best. If you're going to be a singer, be the best. If you're going to be a musician, be the best. If you're going to be a preacher, be the best. If you're going to be a student, be the best. If you're going to be an artist, be the best. Why shoot for the second? Shoot for the first. Come on. Shoot high. Have faith. Have faith in God and faith in what God can accomplish in your life. Amen. I don't believe Christians ought to be the, 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 the dumbest people in the society. I believe Christians ought to be the smartest people because they're children of God. 
It was such a pleasure when we went to high school, and I'm glad that I can talk because Terry is here. We went to high school together. Uh, here he is at the back. I'm so glad that when we went to high school, you got these Hindus and you got the Muslims and you got everybody around you. But it is so glad when you stand up as a Christian and you come first or second or third in class. They call you Christian, they mock you, but then you turn around and show your report and you shine. Amen. Because you're a Christian. See, that's a testimony. But we strive for the best. And so, Enoch, uh, it says in verse 6, For without faith it is impossible to please him, to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. See, when you come to God, you have to believe. Don't chant a prayer and don't even believe God is there. And that is why I said the word believer is hard to find. The reality of that. Because we come to church, and if I believe that the Lord is sitting here, somewhere up here in the service, would I whip out a candy bar and start chewing it? No. Would I just browse on because I'm tired of listening to the preacher? I'm going to go to the bathroom? No. I'd like to be in the presence of God for the whole thing. I would like to sit properly. I like to I'd conduct myself properly. I would not, not like to giggle in the service and make fun. I'd like to respect the presence of God. Amen. Now, how many people really believe God's there? If you believe God was here, would you miss the service? Well, why do people miss the service? Because they really don't believe. There are no, scarcely any real 100% believers today. The devils believe and they tremble. We believe. I believe God. I believe God. Yes, you do. What else? Ask what you will. And it shall be done, but I really don't believe it's going to be done, but I'm asking anyways. And we form a sanctimonious approach to God, when really and truly, if you are to have faith, you must believe that God is. And it says in verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must first believe that he is, and he will reward them that diligently seek him. See, Enoch believed God. Abel believed God. And then it goes to the next one here by faith, Noah. Now put yourself in Noah's position. We're just choosing a few individuals tonight, Brother Joe. Put yourself in Noah's position. Rain never fell on the earth before. Isn't that what it says? The earth was watered by mist. And so God tells this man to build a boat. In the middle of the city. That helicopters would come and transport it to water. Now God said build a boat. And not a canoe. Build a 450 foot long boat. 50 feet wide. Alright. This church I think is 28 feet wide. Add some more width. Three stories high. Pitch it with tar. So they don't sink. I'm going to drown all the sinners. I'm going to flood the world. Now you're building the ark. So you call the building company of your time. With your electric saw. You got three sons. And their wives. And your wife. You're eight people together and you're told to build an ark 450 feet long. He probably had help from the people. I don't know what he did. But my God, you give me a bench to build and I take a whole day. With tools. He had to build this massive boat. And God says, here, I'm going to drown the world. Now, honestly, you can read the story and you believe the story, but if you were Noah, 
Would you think God was nuts? You think he really meant to build that boat? Or you felt like something really led you astray? You had to believe there was going to be a flood. You had to believe the world was going to be, be, be judged. And people were going to die. And to save your family and to obey God, you had to build a boat when there was no water. That is what I call faith. Yes. Yes, it's a strong confidence in God. You believe God said so, and then if God said so, you're going to see it accomplished. And it says, and Noah being warned of God, of uh, 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 things not yet, not seen as yet, moved with fear, fear of God, godly fear, the margin says, prepared an ark, uh, to, uh, to the saving of his house. What did this man do to save his family? And when we look at what we do to destroy our family. We try to compare ourselves with the champions of this Bible. God we're living in. I told Brother Richard and said I'm living on the wrong planet. We had a nice conversation. Long. Over an hour. We talked. And, you know, you, you tr my, my, I love to talk the word of God. And uh, you think about it. Think about it. Let's move on. Uh, he became the ear. This man, he prepared the ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became the heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Can you, can you believe that? He's not only just an ordinary man. He was a righteous man. He was like the champion that established righteousness. He became the, everybody say that, heir of righteousness. Amazing description of Noah. Not just an old man building, putting wood together. The heir of righteousness. Goes on, tells you verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out of it into a place which should afterward receive, re receive an inheritance, obeyed. Now here was this man established with a household, servants. He had people that can go and fight a war for him. And God called Abraham and says, I want you to leave where you're going. And I want to take you across the world almost to a different place that will be your inheritance. It's not like you saw it on a map. A vacation brochure came to you so you know the island you're going to. You know. No. He did not know. He had to go by faith. And he did not, he had enough faith to start the journey. But God had to establish the faith and make it stronger. God says, leave your kindred and come. But he took his kindred. See, God don't just hold you and force you. God let you fall on his rock and be broken. And Abraham did not start as the father of faith. He had to learn faith. So didn't God promise him a land, a proper land with, with prosperity? When he got into Canaan, it was a famine. It is so strange how God operates. It's not strange because we hindsight is 2020 vision. But when we think about it, how God operates, think about it. He chose a virgin to bear his son. He chose a barren woman to bear John the Baptist to be the forerunner of Jesus. When you think about this, Samson did not have a mother that was a regular pregnant woman. She was barren. You mean God just like to choose? But no, no, no. God takes the impossible and make it possible. What was Sarah? Barren. Barren. Say it. Barren. Not only barren, old. And God chooses the impossible to make it possible. He chooses the tough ways because it will strengthen you. But you see, the world out here is telling us otherwise. We like the easy way out. There's no easy way out. You want to be a champion, you got to go through the course. 
But Paul says, I have fought a good fight. You don't escape the fight. You have to fight it. I have finished my course. See, you and I, we all have a course we're working on. And we're not finished. You don't drop out of the course halfway and expect to graduate. No, you got to finish the course, my friend. And the sad thing is that a lot of people feel they can escape the course. Jonah thought he could escape the plan. And so he said, okay, God says, go to Tarsh, go to Nineveh and tell them that I'll destroy them in 40 days. They need to repent. Jonah says, I don't think I'm doing that. I'm going to go to Tarshish. So here is Nineveh, here is Tarshish. Right? Jonah is here, go to Nineveh. No, I'm going to go to Tarshish. Where do you think the whale was waiting for him? On the way to Nineveh? No, on the way to Tarshish. God knew what he was going to do. God had the whale to strengthen Jonah because he was the man that needed help. The men of Nineveh will come up in the resurrection, but Jonah was the prophet that had to go tell them. He had to be worked on. God has a whale for every one of his children that want to escape the path. If you're elect, no running. If you're the elect child of God, no escape. Run. There are guard wheels that will bring you back. You cannot escape the calling of God. Okay, um, so I'm looking at this. You see, if you hold your finger in Hebrews 11 chapter and tar turn back to my favorite scripture in Romans. Uh, I love, all scripture is favorite of mine. But this one here is another favorite one in Romans the 8 chapter. Um, it's such, such, there's so many beautiful scriptures. It says in verse 29, chapter 8 and verse 29, it says, for whom God called. For whom he called. Uh, for, from who, for whom he did foreknow. Now the foreknowledge of God. This is something I don't have. Something that you don't have. It's called foreknowledge. See God occupies eternity. Right? Eternity. You must have a revelation to really understand eternity. Eternity. Eternity does not have present, past, and future. When God made mankind, he made the sun and he made time. He created time. And so we have time. Day one starts it. So anyone that falls in the, in the course of time will age. He that created time does not age. He is outside of time. He knows the start of time. He knows the middle of time. And he knows the end of time. So while you are here born. And you are doing your 20 something years old. He already sees your end. Because he has created it. He knows the start to the end. While you are struggling. Because you don't know why you lost your job. You know you lost your job. You are so sad. He's not worried because he knows that you lost your job. He had a reason for that because he has a plan that when you complete the race, you're a winner. Amen. You don't know because you don't have foreknowledge, but he has a foreknowledge. He sees exactly what you're going to be. Before you were born, he knew what your name was going to be. Amen. Now, you don't know, but he knows. He already sees how many people will be in the bride of Christ ruling in the kingdom. When you are nervous that the world is going ungodly and you want to live on a different planet, he is not. He wants you to live in the kingdom that he will build on this earth that doesn't look like it's going to ever change. But he already sees the end. He has decreed the end. You and I that occupy time... Uh, we are aging and we live in time. We got a problem believing God. So here we come back again. Because we are seeing when we see we, our faith is dampened. I can't believe God is going to heal me. Because the doctors say arthritis can get better. See I'm just telling John. You pick up the guitar tonight. And the reason why I don't play a lot. You see my this little thing here. It's swollen there. You know when I try to play the guitar. 
And I settle for that, you know, I accept that. I should not. I should take my guitar up every day. The more it hurts, the more I play. Well, you see, God is not worried. I'm the one worried because I'm the subject of time. I should have confidence in the one that created time and designed it. And so here in Romans, in verse 28, it says, verse 29, For whom God did foreknow. He knows you. He knows who is going to want to serve him. He knows exactly who was going to sit in this service here tonight. That's right. He knew exactly tonight how many people would miss church. He, know, he, he is not suffering for knowledge. He is, he is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He's everything that does with the omni, some whatever. And it makes him... And we're using a human word which is very frail to describe what he is. But it helps us to understand who he is. And so he knows you. Whom he foreknow, he also did predestinate it. How what he did? He predestinated. Now, now listen. To predestinate. Sounds like a big word, right? Well, it's a destiny that you have. Destination. Your destination, where you're going. He predestinated that you show up in Toronto. He did not even decide you wanted to go to Toronto, but so happened that you end up in Toronto. You have a destiny already planned ahead of you. So predestinate means a plan already set up before you were even born. For he, whom he, pre, he foreknew, them he predestinated to do what? Read it, everybody. He predestinated you to be conformed to the image not of a movie star, not of a rock star, not of grandpa, not of some uncle, not of some uh, rich dude in society. He predestinated you to be confirmed to the image of his son, that Jesus might be the firstborn of men among many other brethren. See, God has predestinated your past. You go to the highest heaven, he's there. And that is the confidence that we have to develop in God, to have confidence that he knows exactly what's right. Amen. Amen. And so, back here in Hebrews, it goes on, I'm looking at the time, trying to balance myself here, it says, uh, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to, verse 8, uh, into his place which he should receive, for an inheritance obeyed. He obeyed God. He went out not knowing whither he went, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, and heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker was God. He was looking for the promise of God. And you can go down and check each one of these individuals that were looking for this promise of God. Hebrews 11, right? And then we skip a few here because of time. And we come down here to uh, some of my favorite. It says, by faith, verse 20, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of uh, Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. And it goes to talk about Joseph, uh, by, about his faith. But you know, my favorite one is Moses, verse 24. It says about Moses, because, you know, we read, see the Ten Commandments, and there's so much to be said about Moses. It says, let's read it again one more time for the second millionth time. It says, verse 24, by faith Moses, when he was come to years. Now, you know, you see the movie, the Ten Commandments, right? All kinds of makeup stuff Hollywood has produced. Here's what the Bible says. When Moses was come to years, he refused. He made a choice. See, why did he do this? Well, verse 26 tells you, the latter part of verse 26, if you go down half in verse 26, for he had respect unto the recompense 
of the reward. He had a goal in mind. He was working for a reward. You know, when you look at old Western movies, a bounty hunter goes out to capture a criminal, take him in for the reward. That's right. He risked his life, but $500, man, for this guy, dead or alive. So he goes halfway around the world to find this guy and kills him, brings him back for the reward. That's why he risked his life. Slept in the desert, almost bitten by snakes. And that is for 500 human dollars that will vanish. But Moses had a greater vision. He had a reward. The recompense of a reward was what he knew God promised him. Amen. See, he had a spiritual goal in mind. Yes, he did. What do you think I'm sitting here in church for 38 years? Because I like to see Brother Tony. I like Brother Tony. No, because I like Sister Dorcas. I like Sister Dorcas. You know, there was one time I was leaving town, but I couldn't leave because there's some people I like in the church. How can I do that? Remember that time I was leaving, Brother John? I was going to leave because I said, this place got nothing for me. I was going to leave. And then I see Brother Vaters that left Newfoundland to come to be with us. I said, how can I leave this man when he left Newfoundland to come to be with me? Couldn't leave. Now he left. He's now passed away, but he left. The other day I got a, to a hold of, of um, his daughter, Jessie. And she said some good things. I got a hold of Jesse on Facebook. You see? And, and she said some good things. See, she talked some good things about what she remembered about me and church. Amen. And you know, she was just a kid. But she remembered that. You understand? So I could not leave. I could not just give up. Because of the recompense of reward. Amen. Now those days, it was the people. Now... It's a project that God's working in my life that's important. Amen. If I want to leave now, I got Brother Terry Day, man. I promised to, that we're going to spend our old days together. Can't leave. Brother John, I promised for us to go to coffee. I don't know when Sister Monica is going to release you one morning that you can come to go for with us a coffee. You know, here's Brother Joe. How can I leave Brother Joe? If an opportunity is open up, I have to refuse it. Because I've got enough reason to stay. And that's what Moses did. It says, he refused, verse 24. Moses, when he was come to years, refused the greatest opportunity a person can have in those days. To become the son of Pharaoh's daughter. My God, you'll be a Pharaoh. Powerful king. He refused. Everybody said refused. Then he made choice. Okay, he had a better opportunity. Sister Althea called me one day, and I don't know if I made you, cause you to help you to make that decision. You had a decision. She was about to make a decision, the important decision between jobs. Remember? You called me, and she told me what her decision was, and I said, that's a good decision. They had a better opportunity, but at the expense of church. More money, expense of church. She had a job, less money, but give her church. Guess what? She made a right decision. Never sacrifice your spiritual life for carnal things. All right? And that's the vision and the burden. And so Moses, what did he choose now? He chose a better job. Let's find out. Choosing rather to suffer affliction. You talk about a man that society think is stupid. Here was one. Was he stupid? No. To man he was. But to God he had a plan. You see he saw the recompense of the reward. People did not know. Come on man. When I was growing up my friends would say let's go play. No I can't play. I gotta go study. Come on. Go play. No I can't play. I gotta study. Terry taught me how to study. I got to kill myself and study to pass the exam. Was it worth it? Yes. 
When it was over, I left my friends growing mustache in school and I went and got a teaching job. You understand what I mean? They were going old in school and I left. But I had to make a sacrifice because of a goal that I had ahead of me. Amen. Understand? And Moses choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now you know why I'm here. I'm here because the end result is what I hope for. I have not gone back an inch in my spiritual development by staying here. Amen. Oh, I might have better opportunities, financial opportunities and all of that. Otherwise, bigger people in a class to study, you know. No. I'm here because the benefits I have sitting here and dealing with the opposition and dealing with the trials and dealing with the negatives and dealing with lack of support. A, a social support I'm talking about is has caused me to grow. The storms that made me more skilled. The Philistines left in the land has taught me how to war. Amen. Amen. That is why James, I love when he says, my, my, he says, uh, brethren, um, count it all joy when you fall into diverse trials. Well, is P Moses any different? Is Paul any different when he says, I gladly bear mine infirmities? He says, the things that were gained to me, I suffered loss. That for the excellency of Christ, the knowledge of Christ, he says, I count loss and do count them but dung that I might win Christ. He says, I glory in mine infirmities. He says, you think any man is better off than me? He says, I was shipwrecked more than anybody here. <laughs> what, you're praising God? Yes, I'm praising God that he has taken me through a path for spiritual development that a few people have gone through. Don't listen to television preachers. Say, Brother Sam told me, and I've got 10 minutes to go. Brother Sam, when he was, um, he's going to probably listen to this tape, but when he got back to uh, Vasai, Brother Sam from Vasai, he called and told me there was a young man he met on the plane. His name was Ben. And he spoke to Ben and Ben says he's 22 years old and he's going to England to become a Catholic priest. And he told Ben, he says, before you do that, talk to Brother Singh. So I got a call. And this gentleman says, my name is Ben and I was told to talk to you. That I'm about to go into training. I said, well, I think Sam directed you to talk to the wrong man. But if you still want to talk to me, call me back in an hour because I was busy. So in an hour, he called me back. And I sat down there and I gave him a good 20 minutes. I say, you know, Ben, let's start with this. If, I, I said, preachers today are a dime a dozen. Everybody's a preacher. I said, but the most dangerous man is not a terrorist with bombs strapped on him. I said, the most dangerous man you can find that will destroy more souls is a preacher that was not called of God that has a Bible in his hand. More dangerous than a terrorist, terrorist that take down 30, 40 people. And that's where the conversation went. And I went down the line with this guy. I told him if he was grandmother call him or his mama call him or whoever sent him out in the ministry. If he's not called, don't go into the ministry. I said, every the greatest liar you can have in the city is a preacher that's not called of God that occupies the pulpit. The devil is transformed as an angel of light. You know, when 20 minutes was done, Ben says, I'm so glad it had to be God that caused Sam to meet me on that plane that I could talk to you. So you got my first tape. You understand? You don't know what God can do. And, and, and so 
Here, here Moses is saying, choosing rather, Scripture is saying, choosing rather to suffer affliction with children of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And this beautiful part, verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches. It wasn't money. It was the persecution that came. The rejection that came. The, whatever Christ suffered, that Moses was prepared to suffer, that was better than money. That all the treasures of Egypt could not compensate for the sufferings of Christ that Moses was esteeming. Greater riches. When you can have a revelation that you can understand that there are riches that's beyond the bank. That God can give you. You suffer with him. You will reign with him. See. You understand when I say believer. Is not a ex non-existent word today. In reality. In the true sense of it. Because we still have to come to the place. Of believing. That Jesus becomes a pivotal example. Of our lives. I wish I could follow him. Like I should follow him. As he demand in scripture. For disciples to follow him. But I'm working on it. Way far behind. But I'm not what I used to be. I'm closer to incorporating his spirit. Now. When somebody is acting. Contrary to what his spirit. Does say. I can recognize that. I don't know what it is to. Hate people. I really have come to the place, I don't hate anybody in this world. Well, if a person meets the devil and shakes his hand, if I meet the devil, I'll shake his hand. And I would say, you dirty old devil. No, I'll say, Satan, sir. He's a delegated authority that Michael did not bring a railing accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. I would say, sir, you're the devil. You're Satan. You're Lucifer. Glad to meet you. If it was not for you opposing my life, I would not be so strong today. But I'm glad you tempted me. Sometime I fell, but hey man, Jesus helped me to defeat you before it's all over. But if you didn't come, I would be just an easygoing guy, not strong in anything. He's there for a purpose. When the purpose is done, he's eliminated. Until that time, I'm glad for the challenge. Amen. 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 And so Moses, it could close on, I got five, less than five minutes. It says, esteeming the reproach greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. And you know, it goes on and it names all of these people down here in Hebrews 11 chapter. It talks about people that serve God. They quenched, verse 30, 35. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured. And that's what I thought about when I'm listening today. I'm listening to the concept. And I heard me saying that if a terrorist hold a gun at your head and deny Jesus, we all will deny him. But you go back 2,000 years ago and you meet a man like Stephen, he would not deny him. You meet a person like Paul, he would not deny him. You meet a person like Moses, he would not deny him. He would stand in the face like a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The joy of the Lord was their strength. Yes. See how powerful that scripture is? That the confidence that God had given them was their strength. How did you get your strength? Confidence in God. That which God had placed in my life is my strength. So these people here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 36, read it for me, everybody. <coughs> what they were? You mean they were stoned because they were serving the Lord, right? Yes, they were. See, it's not happy, happy like everybody wants to do it in this world. <clears throat> Discipleship is a lost, con uh, con uh, uh, it's a lost uh, art. It's a lost 
experience. It's something that is not pursued properly. And it says they were <coughs> stone, they were sawn asunder. That's where the saw. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in tuxedos. No, sheepskin, <coughs> goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom this world was not worthy. <coughs> they wandered in deserts and in mountains, in dens, and in caves of the earth. Everybody together. You know, sometimes you go on Facebook and somebody say, Claim your victory. Say amen and your wealth would be increased. You know, such ignorance. I don't know how you can cope with that. The day I stand in this pulpit and tell you, bring your, write your, all your bills on a, on a list and I'm going to pray that God release it. Is the day you stop coming to church. God is not an idiot. God develops responsibility. The day I might ask you, bring your bills and let me see how irresponsible you are in spending your money. And then we'll give you a course on how to control yourself when you go to the store. I've actually asked someone in this church one time, I said, bring all your credit cards to me. But the time, believe it or not, they brought them, and I said, give them the scissors, I cut them up. And the person cut them up. Did he have like a credit card again? No. I said, you don't have any control over the credit card. You'll be putting yourself in big trouble. I want you to take it and cut it up. Now, that is what a church should do. Teach people how to become responsible. Amen. Don't buy what you can't afford. Learn to suffer. Learn to do without. Don't let the spirit of North America take a hold of you. But look at this. And these all, the ones that died in the caves, the one who wandered in sheepskin, all having obtained a good, good, good. That report card says good report. Through faith, receive not the promise. They did not get it in their lives. But it will happen in the kingdom at the resurrection. Amen. But they died faithfully. Yes. If those boys in the fiery furnace were not delivered by the Lord, they would have died faithfully. Mm -hmm. Did Stephen get delivered? No. no. They stoned him and he said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Mm -hmm. What an attitude. Mm -hmm. But you put yourself in that arena, in the little prison under the arena. And see Nero send your children out for the lions to eat them. Would you still have faith in God? See, our faith in North America is not tried enough. And yet we expect to sit on the same throne that some of these men that died for the sake of the gospel were sitting on. I make a joke. Sounds like a joke. We die of excessive eating. We die of high cholesterol. We die of everything that those would never die from. Right. They die for preaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. They die for spreading the gospel. Mm -hmm. They die for their Christian faith. Mm -hmm. We die from an overabundance that kills us. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Father, tonight was not a good night in your house. And we thank you, Lord, that we could be here. Pray that, Lord, you'd help us. Sometimes it almost looks impossible, but it was because of the confidence you placed in our hearts, with faith being the substance of things hoped for. Please restore our goals and our desire to finish this race that is set before us. Oh, Lord, help us to drop the sin and the weights from our lives that will hinder our progress. Mm -hmm. Give us a revelation, Father. Have mercy on your people and take us right through the end. Mm -hmm. Again, remember those that are not well, that you'll touch their bodies. Continue to heal your people, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.
God bless you. Good to see you all in church tonight. It's not the nicest, most pleasant night out there, but it's not too bad. Chapter. <clears throat> Hebrews 11 chapter is called the Hebrew Hall of Faith. Right? We know that.